you talk about how you want a ceasefire in Gaza so that people can return to their neighborhoods and their homes, how many neighborhoods and homes do you think are left for them to return to? So by various estimates, somewhere around half the buildings, maybe a little over half the buildings 50%. in Gaza have been destroyed or damaged. There are other buildings, obviously, that remain. And we want to see people be able to return to their neighborhoods. Not, and if they don't have homes, we want to see the ability to rebuild them, which is why one of the pieces we uh, uh, have said has to be a priority for the ultimate end of this conflict is reconstruction effort so people can rebuild their neighborhoods and rebuild their homes because the <coughs> devastation has been absolutely catastrophic then across who, Gaza. who do you think should pay for that? Uh, ultimately, it would require um, uh, an international effort with multiple countries contributing. We don't, yeah. Obviously, that's the kind of thing that would have to be worked out. We're not at that stage well, yet because we're not even at the end of the conflict. Okay, fine. But, but, it's the, it's but, the, but, but what countries should be included in this? It's the type of thing that will be the subject of many diplomatic conversations. Can I get to the very specific point here? Do you think Israel should contribute to this? Uh, I think we are a long way from the reconstruction of Gaza. And I, I, I'm not going to make any pronouncements from the podium about who should pay for the reconstruction before yeah, we get to what would be a I'm would not be a asking diplomat. who should pay if, if someone should pay for everything. but. Who should it's, contribute? It, Would the U.S. be willing to contribute? It's not something we can speak to uh, because these are conversations that will happen right. well down the road. On the anniversary of October 7 today, Secretary Blinken specifically mentioned uh, the names of Americans killed by Hamas, but he did not mention Americans who were killed by Israel since October 7, like Tevfik Ajag, Aisha or Ezgi Egi. Why were these Americans not mentioned in the statement? And is that, you know, does that indicate no. a different no. standard for Americans a based on who killed them? Ab absolutely not. And if you've seen this, uh, our public statements, we have spoken out forcibly about American citizens who have been killed today, uh, or have been killed on both sides of this conflict. The statement the secretary put out today, though, was about the anniversary of October 7th. But it, and, the, it hold also on, and hold on, and the people that died in, the attacks on October 7th and the American citizens who were taken hostage on the deaths on the on October 7th. You have seen us on other occasions speak out and we will continue to speak out force, forcefully about other American citizens who die anywhere across the world. But the statement today was about October 7th and in no way is a statement about the anniversary of October 7th going to cover the entire sweep of this conflict. But we thought it was important to on this anniversary of the horrific attacks to <coughs> memorialize the people who were killed as part of those attacks. And, and do you have any update on the investigation into the killing of Aisha Noor? Uh, it, is, it continues to be underway. I don't have an, uh, uh, any further update. Yeah. So now, let that, me ask you that, about that. That, that uh, means that when you answered Saeed and say you don't want to see Gaza reoccupied by Israel, you also don't want the West Bank occupied by Israel, right? Uh, we want to see an establishment of an independent Palestinian state in Israel. Yes, correct. So, you don't want the Israelis to be occupying the West Bank. We want it to be. Right. Uh, we want it to be ultimately its own independent Palestinian state, occupied by Israel, or, uh, not occupied by Israel or anybody else. No, then, we want to see and, governed and, by Palestinians. And, and then, just secondly, and I, I've asked this, and I know others have asked this before, but when you talk about how you want a ceasefire in Gaza so that people can return to their neighborhoods and their homes. How many neighborhoods and homes do you think are left for them to return to? So by various estimates, somewhere around half the buildings, maybe a little over half the buildings in Gaza have been destroyed or damaged. There are other buildings, obviously, that remain. And we want to see people be able to return to their neighborhoods. Not, and if they don't have homes, we want to see the ability to rebuild them, which is why one of the pieces we uh, uh, have said has to be a priority for the ultimate end of this conflict is reconstruction effort so people can rebuild their neighborhoods and rebuild their homes because the devastation has been absolutely catastrophic then who, across Gaza. who do you think should pay for that? Uh, ultimately, it would require um, uh, an international effort with multiple countries contributing. We don't, obviously, that's the kind of thing that would have to be worked out. We're not at that stage well, yet because we're not even at the end of the conflict. Okay, fine. But, it's but, the, it's but, the, but, 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 but. What countries should be included in this? <laughs> it's the type of thing that will be the su subject of many diplomatic conversations. Can I get to the very specific point here? Do you think Israel should contribute to this? Uh, I think we are a long way from the reconstruction of Gaza. And I, I, I'm not going to make any pronouncements from the podium about who should pay for the reconstruction before yeah, we get to what we I'm not asking who should pay if, if someone should pay for everything. But 
Who should it's, contribute? It, Would the U.S. be willing to contribute? It's not something we can speak to uh, because these are conversations that will happen right. well down the road. Let me just uh, continue with a couple of questions. Uh, <clears throat> although it, it was Israel that dropped close to 50,000 tons of bombs on Gaza, rendering where it is now. So maybe they ought to pay for In it. response but, to a war that Hamas right, started. Okay, so maybe Hamas should pay to rebuild right. Gaza. I mean, right. it's, a, me it's, ask, a, it's a complicated you, question is the, right. the point. Say, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Matt. In your response to Humaira, I, I believe, on uh, if Israel was safer today, you said that Israel has degraded Hamas apparently a great deal and so on. So I want to ask you, why the need to continue to bomb tent places and places where Palestinians are advised to go to for safe havens and so on with F-35s and bombs that are 2,000 pound bombs? So the why, why is there a need? To continue to do this kind of bombing. So I'm not going to speak to a particular to any particular decision about what kind of strike to use, but they continue to engage with okay. uh, Hamas forces in Gaza because Hamas forces continue to pose a threat. But site right. that just goes to the point that I was making that they will never end the conflict in Gaza through a military response as well. Mm -hmm. It is going to take a political approach, it is going to take a different governance approach, and it is going to take an approach that means that something other than Hamas, and it can't be Israel, it can't be the IDF, but something other than Hamas is in Gaza governing. Mm -hmm. But the, Israel continues to use these, these bombs, these huge bombs. In fact, bombing a, a coffee shop in the West Bank, which is an area they control. They should not be bombing by, you know, area bombardment, uh, coffee shops and so on. But you mentioned a point that takes me to my other point. Uh, Israel st seems to be cutting off the, nor the north of Gaza from the south. They're basically, uh, you know, what is underway is nothing short of ethnic cleansing. Now, you all along have said, and the president, I, I think the secretary said that, I'm not so sure whether the president said that or not, but uh, you don't want to see Gaza reoccupied. You don't want to see any part uh, of, of Gaza uh, reoccupied. Are you aware of these reports and do you have a response to them? We have seen these reports. Let me uh, uh, state first very clearly that no, we do not want to see Gaza occupied by Israel. We do not want to see the territory of Gaza shrunk in any way on a permanent basis. And when it comes to these reports, we are engaging with the government of Israel to find out exactly wh what it is they intend. But I will say just generally speaking, we want to see people in Gaza be able to return to their neighborhoods, not being able to force to not being forced to leave their neighborhoods. Now, if there are Hamas militants operating underneath uh, an apartment building before Israel launches a strike on that on those militants, I think you would want to see the civilians evacuated. That would be something that, that would be a good thing for those civilians to see that they are out of harm's way. But it gets back to this broader point that I made, which is as long as you don't have a political path forward and you don't have a solution to the very real governance questions, it, you can k kill Hamas fighters, but other Hamas will continue to recruit other fighters and continue to put the Palestinian people in danger and continue to engage, endanger Israeli security as well. That will give Israel a cause for continuing this war. I mean, nobody expected a year ago that this war would be going on at this time, but it is. And it can conceivably go on for many more months, maybe even years, and so on. What is the end game? What are you, in your view, what is the end game of Israel? We want to see a ceasefire mm -hmm. that brings the hostages home, that alleviates the suffering of the Palestinian people, that, um, that um, allows humanitarian aid to surge in to Gaza. We want to see um, an agreement on a political path forward that ensures that Palestinians can choose their own leaders and that Hamas does not continue to reign as a terrorist organization of Gaza over Gaza. And ultimately, we want to see Gaza and the West Bank reunited as an independent Palestinian state. Uh, uh, of, I have seen different reports with respect to that very question. Uh, we don't know, as I said earlier, the ground truth of what happened, which is why we're, we think it's appropriate that investigation be conducted. So you think that there were other people shooting? Said I said I have seen reports that other people were shooting. I don't know the ver veracity of any of those reports, which right. is why we're seeking more information. And you expect to get any results from these investigations, we do. these reports? We Will do. you come back to us next week and tell us this is? I can't promise you next week because I don't know how long an investigation will take. But so certainly, what? but hold on. Certainly, when an investigation is completed and we're briefed on that investigation, I'm happy to come br uh, brief you on that. Uh, on on the principle of it, why is it so difficult for this government? to say, we condemn the killing of, of children, Palestinian women and children. Why can't you say the word 
condemn. Uh, we do. We, I, I, Saeed, if you listened to what I said a moment ago, yeah, I, 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 hold on, hold on, hold, Saeed, please don't interrupt me. Yeah. I said far too many right. Palestinians have yeah. died. Thousands right. of Palestinian children have died, and it is a, a, a tragedy when right. one of them dies. Of course, we don't want to see a single right. child die. Um, we don't want to see anyone die right. uh, as a result of this conflict, which is why we have been working to bring this conflict to a close as soon as possible. But uh, uh, whenever you ask me these questions, I do think you continue to kind of just elide over the fact that Hamas bears a great deal of responsibility for putting those children in harm's mm -hmm. way. Remember, it was Hamas that launched this co war in the first place with an attack on Israel that killed men, women, and children, and that Hamas that hid and continues to hide behind children is human shields. So okay. yes, we're, we're we do, okay. yes, we, we do not want to see right. any child yeah. die. We don't want to see any innocent civilian die, which is why we are working so hard to try to achieve a temporary ceasefire that would alleviate their suffering. Yeah. Yet I have not heard the word condemn. I mean, you know, this war began way before October 7. I mean, you know, in fact, the reason that uh, this administration was so strong on, you know, pursuing a Middle East peace and so on, because the war had been going on for, for decades before and so on. We heard this administration when they came into office talking about reopening the consulate, talking about reopening the, the, the PLO office here, talking about restarting and reigniting uh, peace talks and so on, re-aiding uh, UNRWA and so on, simply because that war has been going on for a very long time, because so Gaza was under siege for a very, very long time. Saeed, so nothing, I, no, nothing that happened before October 7th justifies what Hamas did on that day. And it is, it is what Hamas did on that day that led to the outbreak of this war and led to the suffering of right. so many innocent Palestinians. So, and I, and I, I, I just feel it's important okay. to correct that fact. That's fine. I mean, you know, you, you guys said this many times before, but in fact, you know, Israel has been waging war on Gaza for a, a very, very long time. Let me ask you on the aid issue, on the trucks and the trailers and so on. Is there anyone other than Israel that is holding the aid from going in? Uh, it is not a question of aid going in. That's not the, the, the problem right now, Hama, uh, uh, Said. The problem is that when aid gets in, there is a distribution problem right. inside Gaza right now because there are police officers, some of whom are members of Hamas, right. who have been providing this, the security for those uh, 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 the, for that distribution inside inside Gaza. And what Israel says is that they have a legitimate right to go after members of Hamas. So we would uh, uh, obviously prefer to see members of a security force inside Gaza who are not Hamas members, but. That's not where we are today. So, so, it is, so, so it is a situation that we continue to try to work so, through. So this is really the classic catch-22 kind of situation because Hamas governed Gaza for a very it, long time. All the police, all the, you know, I'm many, well many of the security forces and so on. Unless you supply Gaza with, with police and, you know, other um, staff, people, whatever, who are from Egypt, from anywhere, to distribute these things. It's going to be the same people uh, uh, to distribute it. As I correct? said, it is So this is really, really saying, okay, you can't, you know, <laughs> it's a catch when issue situation. I don't think you're listening to what I said. What I said is we believe the way to ultimately solve this problem is to try to get a temporary ceasefire that would get hostages out and alleviate this problem and let, uh, 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 make it possible for aid to move around and get pe food in people's mouths so they're not so hungry and they're not so desperate that they're swarming the convoys that do come in. Uh, last uh, question. Not, last, not, last, not, I, sorry, just I have one, go last to, one last Allow question. Me, then, one last yeah. question. Do you suspect that uh, Mr. Netanyahu perhaps authorized this uh, raid to scuttle the negotiations? There is, no, there, there, there is no evidence of that that I have seen, Said. Thank you. Matt, welcome back. Thank we you. missed you. So uh, a couple of, of questions that you know, follow up on uh, Simon and uh, Kamala. On, uh, first of all, on the talks itself, you, you said that you know the Hamas's response was late in coming, but you know the resolution at the at the Security Council was on Monday. The response was on Tuesday, almost like 24 hours and so on. The I don't think the clock uh, started with the UN Security Council okay. resolution. It started with the the okay. so, proposal being delivered to them, which was 12 uh, days before their okay. response. Okay. Uh, on the issue of the response, now we're a bit confused because. Uh, the National Security Advisor, Mr. Sullivan, said actually they were minor. You know, most of, the, all, in fact, all the suggestions by Hamas or the amendments were quite uh, workable, quite doable. Now, that we is, heard that something is, different. That, that is not what he said, but go ahead. Okay. He said a number of them were minor, some were, yeah. some were okay. problematic. Well, that's what, that's what the, uh, that's my question, actually. But the Secretary 
said that there are some workable and some are not workable. Can you share with us some of these things that are not workable, for instance? No, I cannot. I'm not going to get into the details okay. of that from here. I don't think it's, I think it's appropriate to, to conduct a public negotiation. Okay. But uh, as the secretary said, there are a number of things that Hamas suggested in this response that go f further than they had agreed to in previous iterations. As you know, there have been proposals that go back and right. forth. And as the secretary said, usually in a negotiation, if someone, if uh, a party agrees to something in one stage yeah. of the negotiation, they don't then further, they don't then make a more or, or a less reasonable uh, demand later on in the process. So uh, all that said, we'll continue to push to try to get a resolution because we think it's in the interest of all the Palestinian so, people and the Israeli people. So uh, as far as I know, there's been no official Israeli response, but you guys keep saying, that Israel agreed to this. Yet we have not heard from the prime minister. We have not heard from any senior uh, official saying, yeah, we accept or reject, you know, for whatever. There's been no response. So there are reports, Israeli media reports, that say that the prime minister did not even share the document with many of his ministers. And that's, you know, like Ben Fear or Smotrich and so on. Do you have any comment so on that? If the Israelis have not responded, why are they taking so long to respond to something that initially was their proposal. Why are they taking a long time? The Israeli government does not need to respond to its own proposal. It's their proposal. But in terms of, of support, for this, to be clear, in terms of support for that proposal, two things. Number one, it's not true that the Israeli government hasn't come out and said it was their proposal and they support. They did do that. They did that in the days immediately after. There were advisors to the prime minister that came out and said that publicly. Number two, the secretary discussed this directly with the prime minister himself on Tuesday when we were in Israel, and the prime minister reaffirmed his support for the proposal. So it's in simply not true. Statement? Did he support it? In, in a direct conversation with, it, hold on, it, but in a direct conversation with the secretary, the secretary laid publicly, but, all, but Saeed, again, there are officials from, from the Israeli government right. who have come out and said that as well. Okay, but, you know, then clear for us, because at least I'm confused on the issue of the first phase and the second phase and so on. It seems that the Israelis, in all their statements, they focus on the first phase, but not on the transitional second phase and, you know, on, let's say, allowing all the stuff that is in the second phase and the third phase. So then, but as I said, we are committed to continue to work on this because it is so vitally important to the people in the region. Okay, just a couple of uh, follow-up. Uh, there's, there's been a UN report detailing Israeli war crimes during the first month of the war. Have you seen the report? Uh, we are, we saw that the report was released today, and we were reviewing it and, now. Uh, okay, so you, you don't have any comment on that. Uh, other than that, we are, okay. we are and, looking and at uh, it. And uh, lastly, uh, on last Saturday's raid, now there has been more than 276 Palestinians were killed, uh, you know, in in Jabalia. So, and I know that the U.S. government, the Western government, congratulated uh, Israel on releasing freeing four hostages. But you know, then we had 276 Palestinians civilians, you know, mainly civilians, and 600 others wounded. How do you, how do you respond to this kind of enormous death toll? So the secretary actually spoke to this the last couple of days while he was in the region. And um, I'll just echo what he said, which is our condolences go out to any innocent civilian that was killed or injured in this operation. We don't want to see any civilian die in this operation. That's one of the reasons why we're pushing for a ceasefire is to stop the, the suffering that is happening every day in Gaza. If you look at the circumstances of this raid, uh, there are a couple things that are clear. Number one, Israel has a right, as any country does, to try and rescue hostages that were taken. Hostages never should have been taken in the first place. They shouldn't have been held for more than eight months. They should have been released a long time ago. They should be released today. But any country would have the right uh, to, to try and rescue hostages that are being held by a terrorist organization. That's the first thing. The second thing that's clear is that in the course of executing that raid, there was an intense firefight between Israel and Hamas. And I think that's important to, to, to note, that it wasn't just Israeli soldiers firing as they executed that raid. It was Hamas firing at them, and of course there was a crossfire um, of what apparently, by all accounts, was a very intense firefight between Israel and Hamas. And as a result of that very intense firefight, seems like more than 200 people died, and that is an immense human tragedy. But that is why we are working so hard to get a ceasefire, to stop that kind of human tragedy, both for Palestinian people and for the hostages that continue to be held, and for the families of hostages who continue to worry about the safety of their loved ones. And that's why we're going to continue to try and push and get that ceasefire as soon as possible. So you think that Israel adhered to the laws of war 
in this particular incident? I do not. I cannot give you an assessment of that, but not not having looked at all of the details and knowing all of the fa the facts on the ground. As I said, they have a right to re to rescue hostages. We want to see them comply with the laws of war. In this case, there was a very intense firefight. They took fire from Hamas. Uh, on their way after uh, retrieving uh, uh, one of the sets of hostages, and that led to this um, really horrific human tragedy. Thank you. One more question on Gaza, if you don't mind responding to the reports of Palestinians being shot as they were fleeing northern Gaza. Uh, so we have seen those reports. I can't speak to the details of them, but obviously that would be unacceptable. If they were Palestinian civilians that were fleeing, that were uh, uh, were being shot by Israeli forces, that would be unacceptable. We would expect the government of Israel to investigate it, and we, if appropriate, we'd expect them to hold people fully accountable. Is the U.S. investigating it? Uh, we, are, we are not conducting our own investigations. As a matter of first course, it's appropriate for the, uh, for the government of Israel to conduct investigations. We have uh, uh, intervened with them in the past about this type of incident, and they've told us they have hundreds and hundreds of ongoing investigations into potential violations of the IDF rules of conduct, and we expect them to conduct those investigations. And as I said, if they show wrongdoing, to hold people accountable. Have you told them to in conduct investigations specifically into these incidents that have occurred this week? I'm not aware of any specific con uh, contact with them about this incident per se, but this is the type of thing that we often communicate with them about, and it's the type of thing we expect them to take action on. Question of the amount of money that um, the U.S. has sent to Israel uh, during the course of this conflict. Um, you said that the, the number produced by Brown University was incorrect. Do you have a number that you can give yet? Yeah, I did go back and, and um, dig into this, and the answer, I think, shows why it's such a complicated question. So um, since October 7th, we the department has provided $6.8 billion in foreign military financing to the government of Israel. That's financing that we provided them that they then used to purchase uh, U.S. weapons. $3.3 billion of that was in the memorandum of understanding between uh, our two countries that was signed somewhere around a decade ago and that continues to be in effect. And then there was an additional $3.5 billion to the, that was included in the supplemental. So that is money that we have provided Israel, to Israel to purchase U.S. weapons. It's not the same as the amount of weapons that have, uh, Israel has actually purchased and that have been delivered in the past year, which gets to why this is a, a difficult question. So we have approved $5 billion in actual government-to-government -government sales. Most of that $5 billion would be included, would come out of that $6.8 billion. But not all of it would be from that $6.8 billion because some of it would have been uh, money that was a, that was provided to Israel in previous years that they had not yet spent down. Um, so that gets you to why it's a like why it's a, a bit of a tricky question to answer whether you're looking at it as money that we have provided to Israel for um, uh, weapons purchases or actual uh, purchases that they have um, uh, made. And then there's another 500 million dollars uh, that's a separate. Um, pot of money that the State Department doesn't uh, administer, but it's for missile defense. It's administered out of the Pentagon that is also contained in the, the memorandum of understanding that we provided as well. My uh, arithmetic's not that great. Could could you... It's probably better than mine. Could, could you just tell me <laughs> so what, what are the... Government and English the, majors. The so if you're going to ask me to do math here at the podium, I, 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 we're, we're, we're in I for mean, trouble. I, I have a sociology degree, so... <laughs> um, the, uh, but, but if you add those numbers together, all the different programs... Um, the number comes out. What, what is the number? You, you know, you're, so that, uh, you're setting your own parameters here. So, that, um, so I mean, that, that's what I mean. It's, it, yeah. That's why it's, it depends what you're looking at. So, if you take the 6.8 that we provided them in foreign military financing, there's 6.8, and another 500 million in missile fund, that would be 7.3. But not all that money has been spent in the past year, year, right? That's money that's been provided them. It's a different question than what has actually been delivered. Even if you look at that five billion dollars that they have spent. Not all of those weapons were delivered in the past year, so they spent that money. Some of those won't be delivered for years to come. Then there's the entire separate question of sales that we notify to Congress. This sometimes gets get, uh, make, uh, draws public attention. So we notify Congress of a potential sale to Israel. Congress signs off on that sale, and it gets reported that we've approved, say, $2 billion in sales. This is money that Israel does not yet have, that they expect to get under future uh, uh, 
tranches of money under the memorandum of understanding and will spend in future years. So oftentimes when you see reports about money that we have provided them for the delivery of, say, of F-16s, that's money that's not going to be spent by Israel for years and years to come. That gets why it's, I, I'm not trying to overstate it, but it's a tricky question to answer. I guess with, there's been fairly various uh, U.S. government statements on, on support for Ukraine that have been able to come up with numbers, yeah. right? Often when you're, because for the purposes of trying to emphasize how much support you've given, right? So is there, is there not just a, a, no. a number that we can say, all right, since no. October, we've, uh, this amount has been newly approved? So right? that, that is, it is an entirely fair question. And the answer is because the Ukraine money is, un, is exercised under a completely different program. It's exercised under the drawdown. And the drawdown, we are able to, to say exactly what we're providing and how much that money costs. Because that is money, that is uh, equipment that is in our stocks right now. And whenever we make those announcements, we're able to look and see we are providing them with these specific items and they cost this amount of money. It's very different than looking at an overall um, uh, relationship that is much more complex, that is much more longstanding, in which ex Israel exercises authority under different programs. Those are the programs I was just going through for military financing being the chief most way in which we uh, provide them with support. But Matt, can you not just tell us how much of that $6.8 billion FMF over the last year has actually turned into delivered weaponry to so, Israel? So it, I, mean, I, I can't because it gets to this question. $5 billion, first of all, not all the 6.8 will be spent this year, right? $5 billion has been spent by the government of Israel for these FMF, uh, FMF sales over the past, uh, uh, past year. Some of that $5 billion is from the 6.8. Some of it is left over FMF from previous years. Um, some of that has been delivered in this year. But there are other things that will have been delivered that Israel would have purchased before October 7th, but the deliv deliveries don't happen until later. So that's why it's a, it's a tricky question. We don't, have, we don't do an accounting based on delivery dates, right? We do an accounting based on when the government purchased something from us. And so they don't have an accounting of like, let's say there was something that they purchased in 2018 and it was delivered in March of this year. That wouldn't be contained in this number. It's part of our long-term security arrangement. And it wouldn't, you know, it's not, it's not, we don't track it that way. We track it based on the amount of money that we've provided to them in any given year. And I'm trying to give you the, the, the uh, best information I have on that. Listen, you said you want the airport in Beirut to stay open and you want the uh access to the airports. Does that mean that you have complained to the Israelis about this apparent bombing of the road, of one of the roads to the airport? We have made clear to them that we want to see those roads continue to be operational. Yeah, I'm sorry. So did you say that, hey, you shouldn't have done that? I'm not going to speak to that strike, we may, but we may have made well, clear to them, even go, just going back before that specific strike, we have made clear that we want to see those roads to the airport open so American citizens and, how and others can get out. Would you th do you think that that, it, what that was? So we have it, seen 900. I mean, I just saw pictures of, of the road in flames. And, uh, uh, and we saw around 150 American citizens able to get to the airport yeah, today yeah. and able yeah. to leave. But and we you have said, but you other said flights that, that are planned. Look, it is an ongoing right. situation, but we want to see the roads La open. La last thing, and I'll stop. In response to, I think it was Hibbe's question about uh, Unifil. So what is it that you want Unifil to do? Nothing? Just stand there and watch? So we want to ultimately see Unifil fulfill its security role. Um, the question about what they do in the immediate uh, days is a question for Unifil to make, not the United States. But we want to see them, no, 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 not, we want to see them not be put in harm's sure, way. It's a, yeah, but they're a peacekeeping force. Correct. They're a peacekeeping force there to push Hezbollah yeah, so back look, from the border. Peacekeeping forces don't go into places like, you know, uh, you know, yeah. they don't go into resort communities Correct. and expect there to be nothing except for you know, we, beach we became, and cocktails. We don't. We don't. So we what, don't want to. We don't want to see them attacked by well, Israel. No, we don't want to sure see them respond, return but, fire by Israel. We do not want to see but if any kind of conflict. But if they're not preventing anything from happening, I mean, I, I guess, do you want them to prevent, to keep the peace, or do you want them just to sit there and do? And watch. Ultimately, and we want to see their role as one that prevents Hezbollah from 
occupying the space in southern Lebanon that Hezbollah has continued to occupy for years and from where they have launched attacks uh, against Israel. That's what they were put in there to do. Right. And that's the role that we want to see them play. What's happening right now is Israel is conducting operations to push Hezbollah back. Yeah. We hope those operations are successful. So and if Unifil, they, say, so and if they do push them back, we want Unifil and the LAF to, so, fi so to you, fill that security vacuum. So you don't see Unifil as having any role uh, in terms of Israelis going into Lebanon? Uh, and, their and role is there to keep Hezbollah. There. Uh, back they now for a variety of reasons Unifil and the laugh have not been He's able keeping involved like uh, you're uh, keeping the uh, peace uh, not between I'm aware, one but, side but you're... for a variety of reasons Unifil and laugh have not been able to prevent Hezbollah from sitting in those areas just over the border from Israel and launching rocket strikes and other attacks against Israel so Israel is taking steps okay at the see, end of that we want to see Unifil play that see, role this isn't an anti-israel question and I'm not suggesting that Unifil should be taking action against Israel but they haven't been able to do it. So why do you think they're going to be effective now? Uh, I mean, with in terms of Hezbollah. So I'm not going to make any predictions about what will happen. What we have seen is Hezbollah's forces degraded. I can't tell you if it's going to be degraded enough. That not by willing. Unifil. No, I know. I know but, but <laughs> and I'm, they haven't been pushed back Hold by on. Unifil. I'm talking about what's happened by the last 10 days. I can't tell you whether they're going to have been degraded enough that Unifil is strong enough to come in and fill that security vacuum. But that is the open question that is being presented by the current operations in southern Lebanon. This administration has financed a genocide in Gaza for the last year, and every day you're up there denying accountability for it. So, I mean, okay. what gives you the right to lecture other countries on their moral? So, if you have a policy question for me, I'm happy to take it. If you want to give a speech, no, but there are plenty I mean, of places in Washington where you can give a speech. Yeah, but people are, are sick of the bullshit in here. I mean, like, it is okay. a genocide. I'm gonna you go are abetting it, another question. and you go are ahead. risking nuclear go war ahead. in Ukraine plenty, for this plenty proxy Plenty of other war. places to give a speech. Go ahead.